Shall I? All right, we are ready to get started. You know, we always like to do the, uh, the money session this time of day because we know none of y'all care about money. So that's always, uh, always worth doing. I have here with us uh, Allison Frazier of the Charles Koch Institute. I remember I first came across her reading, I was Detroit bankruptcy stuff a couple years ago. So we have that optimistic uh, theme in common of bankruptcy and doom and uh, Good stuff Detroit like and all those things. And then, of course, uh, the guy I sometimes refer to as the, uh, the reporter I want to be when I grow up, uh, Jim Pethokoukas yes. of the American yes. Enterprise Institute, yes. whose work I'm sure you all know and you see all over the place. So our theme today is the future belongs to the free market. I think we all maybe implicitly assume that, that <coughs> capital gets to go where it wants and it's going to go where it's loved. And uh, the places that have those sorts of institutions where you can be a profitable investor, where you can be a profitable entrepreneur, are the places to which the economic future belongs. But that doesn't mean that the free market future is going to be here necessarily. So I think the first question I wanted to ask is, um, is, is that future here? You know, I think of people like, you know, the extreme case being someone like Jim Rogers, who has decamped to Singapore and is raising his kids speaking Chinese and that sort of thing. Maybe an overreaction. 20 years from now, he might look real smart. Who knows? Uh, so why don't we start? Uh, what do you think? Is that, is that where the future is, here, or is it elsewhere? Uh, I think it'll be in a lot of places, and I think that this will be one of them. Um, so you can ping me the sunny optimist. Uh, I took great, actually great encouragement from Detroit filing for bankruptcy, sort of like the title of your book, Super Awesome Future for Them. Yeah. Um, so I so far, that doesn't seem to be panning out. <laughs> well, you know, be optimistic <laughs> and patient. Yeah, I think this will be one of the places um, where we have a great free market future. Um, but I think it's incumbent on us um, and the larger free market movement to not be good defenders of free markets, but to be good proponents of free markets. So I think we get too defensive um, as free marketers, and I think we really need to do a better job talking about the strengths, why do we love free markets. So there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and I'm optimistic that we'll be one of the places, maybe not the leading place, but maybe one of the places. All right, Jim? Um, well, I was, I was thinking, what if, you know, what if we held this panel uh, instead of today? What if it was in 1999 or 2000 and you said, you know, you know what are the future of markets? What are the future, of, will America be a, you know, a, a place that you know, embraces markets and uh, the power of markets? Uh, we, I think we, it, it probably wouldn't even have been a topic. It would have been so obvious. The answer would have been a robust yes. I mean, I just, I just like in, in, in the cab, I, I wrote down just things that would have made me optimistic about it. One, you, 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 had the, you, had the, you had the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, not, not long before that. You had China, you know, to get rich is glorious, embr embracing markets. Uh, we're in the middle of sort of this tech boom, a productivity boom. You had, you know, Bill Clinton saying the era of big government is over. You know, budget was in, was in good shape, and this isn't technically in 1999, 2000. <laughs> but you also had, uh, you had the iPod, you know. So, so I remember back then people saying, listen, uh, we have, we have a pro-free market future. Young people are going to embrace markets because they have iPods and they're going to want all that choice and customization that you can't get from, uh, you can't get from big government. So, that, so we have a bright future. Now, 15 years later, um, Soviet Union's back. <laughs> uh, uh, China uh, is, presents an alternate model of markets, one of, one of state capitalism. We had the tech boom uh, go bust. Uh, productivity in the U.S. has gone you know, like nowhere uh, in a decade. We, you know, we have debt on the rise, um, and uh, you know, in 2000 we had the corporate scandals, and of course we had this, we had this financial crisis. So, is it so obvious today that uh, we're going to be as embracing of free markets as we went in the past? Um, you now there was, a, you know, Bloomberg's been taking this poll the past few years, asking people. You know, are you, you know, do you believe sort of in the power of markets? Do you think government should be doing a lot more? And it's been about 50-50. So maybe the kind of bats we're at, we're at sort of a tipping point moment where either we're going to, maybe we'll tip and we'll, we'll, we'll realize that 
uh, you know, maybe markets aren't to blame for like the last 15 years of stagnation. And in fact, we need to be more market oriented and perhaps we'll go the other way and we'll just want a lot more economic security, a much bigger government. And I, I don't I, th I think it, I think it really could go either way. All right, a little measured uh, optimism there. Oh, but Uber. I, I, was, I was told to mention Uber <laughs> as mention a Uber. shining symbol <laughs> of pro markets and the sharing economy. So my God, so, so okay, so we have the financial crisis on one side, but we got we Uber. Uber. Right. So that, that will, of course, balance it off in people's, you know, when people, people think are going to think markets. Uber's uh, sponsoring it, so <laughs> it's just not the case. Don't forget food trucks. <laughs> right, food, food, trucks. food trucks, very awful. Awesome. When you're uh, talking about, you know, what young people think about free markets and all that and, and why they aren't more uh, free market than they are, and I think so much of that has to do with specific conditions that prevail at certain points in life. You know, so I finished college in 1996 uh, at the University of Texas, which was probably the best year in American history to be at college. I mean, you just couldn't not have a job. I used to keep a little thing we joked about. We called it the uh, Austin Economic Indicator, which was the Taco Bell across the street from the campus, because they just couldn't get people to work there. So my last day in Austin, that Taco Bell, this is the 90s, was paying people like, it was 11 bucks an hour, 12 bucks an hour, plus a $1,000 longevity bonus if you were there for 90 days. 90 um, days. 90 days. It's 90 days. Now, if you got out of college in, you know, June of 2008, or God help you, January of 2009, you probably have a little different outlook about what, you know, the possibilities are. So when I was 22 years old, everyone I knew was you know, starting a company or going to work for one. Uh, we were all going to be internet millionaires. It didn't work out that way, as it turns out. Uh, some of us went into journalism. <laughs> But there is not that sense, I think, of, uh, of optimism, that sense of possibility. And one thing we know from you know, the political research is that if you look at someone whose income is, is fairly low, you know, a household income of $22,000 a year, $23,000 a year, you can take two households with identical incomes, but the people who expect to be doing better tend to be much more free market, more conservative, as we would use the term, uh, much more uh, excited about and trusting in free enterprise. People who expect to be doing worse tend to be welfare status. So we're, I think, in a very difficult moment where a lot of people who are, say, 26 and younger, 27 and younger, and, and we let these idiots vote, um, have, uh, you know, ha, ha, I mean, they're not old enough to have their own health care, apparently, yet they're still on their mom and dad's insurance, but, but they're voters. Um, all you got to be is 18. Um, don't you worry a little bit about that, that we're in a culturally bad place for where the, the youngest uh, cohort is? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a significant challenge to us. I think that the kids today feel a lot different as they're coming out of college, if they're going to college. Um, and if they're coming out, they're coming out with a lot of debt. I didn't have debt. I had great parents, but they didn't have to pay as much as, you have to pay, as I'm paying for my daughter, who's going to graduate in uh, a couple weeks here. Um, so I, I think we're definitely in a different moment than we were, but I graduated from college a lot earlier from you, and it was a, you know, I graduated in the late, uh, in, I shouldn't even say when, but it was a different time. Uh, and it was, they were really challenging, um, it was a really challenging opportunity. Or you challenging say that like Eisenhower's. I know, <laughs> God, I'm really old. No, um, so I graduated in the end of the Jimmy Carter era, um, and that wasn't an op uh, optimistic time, and then we ushered in a completely optimistic time uh, under the next president, under his successor. So I think that these things come and they go, but you're right, it is, I, I do worry about sort of the, um, how far government has gotten and how, how grown and how far away from markets we've come. But I'm optimistic because I think we are really on, you know, the precipice on a, on a positive tipping point in terms of technology. And we laughed a little bit about Uber, but you think about all the changes in technology that are really improving people's lives um, and that, that the regulators can't really keep up with. Now, we shouldn't be complacent about that um, because there's, you know, there's really no more voracious appetite than the appetite of a regulator to fix stuff and to protect people. But I think as much as, as young people are cynical uh, and worried about their opportunities, they're also very positive. I mean, think about, you kind of left about the iPhone or iPod a little bit, but we have iPhones and, 
droids and all this stuff that are really changing people's lives, not just in this country, but in really poor countries. Um, we have great technology from drones, so there was like the World Cup drone competition in uh, the UAE of all places. Where there's this like drones, are arguably a mixed blessing. Yeah, it is a mixed blessing. No, that's right. But some of the really powerful things that came out of this competition are things like technologies with drones, where they can get um, blood, medical supplies, even organs to remote locations. So think about the implications for that technology, say in Nepal right now, going through a terrible. So I think we're on this cutting edge. Drones are mixed, and and this is why. Free, uh, free markets are an integral part of the conversation that we want to have about a free society. So you have to balance what are the rules of the road for things like drones against privacy and safety. So we need to be not complacent about regulators, but I just really am optimistic about how technology is on the cusp of really taking us to the next level of improving our lives and giving these opportunities to kids to be entrepreneurs sure. in a way that they couldn't. We'll, uh, by the way, uh, be doing the questions the uh, same way we have been before. Uh, index cards will be around. You can pass them up. Uh, don't ask for stop tips. None of us have any. Um, well, I could, I, I, oh, go ahead, I, I please. Just yes. yes. um, riff off that. Uh, but I, I, I'm wondering, though, if people will make the connection, uh, or young people uh, will make the connection between, you know, the stuff and the gadgets and what you know, you know, what they see happening, you know, in Silicon Valley and the apps, to, you know, to government policy. Because again, what I was referring to um, in my earlier answer is that you know, what, you know, what are their memories? Their memories, uh, the last you know, conservative uh, Republican president was him leaving office saying, I had to abandon free market principles <laughs> to save the free market system you know, as, he's, as he's sprinting away from the White House practically. So that's, so that, that's their drive. memory, right? You know, that's, that, that is their memory of what happens when you have conservative economics, uh, tax cuts, and that, and that is a very powerful message. And I realize that a lot of Republicans, they, are, they aren't talking about the Bush years, they're sort of, you know, they had kind of like, you know, you know 280s and they're, and they're, and they're, and they're skipping to, to today, and they'll talk a lot about, well, remember, the, well, we'd rather talk about the Reagan example. But for a lot of people, they're, gonna, they're, they're not going to remember the Reagan example, they are going to remember right. the Bush example. So I just think it's, it's going to be a much harder sell, um, I think, selling young people that we need these free market principles, that, that's what will produce you know, the kind of widely shared prosperity uh, that, we, that we all want. I don't think Republicans are sort of grant that they can sort of just kind of paper over that and not talk about it and not think of like a good counter argument and instead saying, man, those Reagan years are great, which they were, but still. Well, I think one of the problems with that is that material progress is invisible in free societies. So if you could take, you come to national review conferences to hear people use the phrase kids today unironically. <laughs> if you could take kids today to 1976, you know, material life kind of sucked in 1976 compared to where it is now in terms of, you know, the quality of things like everything that you used, the houses people lived in, the sort of food that was available to you at the grocery store. You know, if you go back to the 1950s, groceries ate up about 40% of the median household's income. Now it's something like 6%. Uh, you know, we're, we're immeasurably wealthier than we were, but the stuff all comes invisibly. Yeah. You know, it's not uh, dramatic. It's just things keep mm -hmm. getting a little bit better, a little bit better, and it sort of sneaks up on you, so it's really hard to get people to uh, appreciate that, you know, quiet, everyday miracle that we treat as though it were just uh, ordinary. And I, and I think that's one of the, the, the big cultural challenges with it. But the other cultural challenge for, for the right, especially, is, uh, is concrete policy. So we got Larry Kudlow was here last night, and if Larry's around, uh, I, wow, uh, whatever, was that a drum roll? Or, uh, uh, Larry's a dear friend of mine, I, I love Larry Kudlow, but um, you know, if you, if you say, Larry, we've got a problem, the economy's a little bit stagnant, what should we do? He's gonna say, you know, we need some tax cuts. You say, Larry, you know, there's a problem with uh, productivity, what, what, what should happen? He's gonna say, we need some tax cuts. You know, I, I, I'm going to call Larry up one of these days say, I've been run over by a bus. You need some tax cuts. And he's going to say, you should probably have some tax cuts. And that's going to, you know, it's going to help that out. And that worked for Republicans and for the Republican Party for a long time because, you know, starting in the, in the 1950s when you had really, really high personal income tax rates mm -hmm. and you had people, you know, on the other side, John Kennedy, among others, understanding the problem with that. But Republicans have, you know, done such a good job of cutting taxes that there's, there's not a lot of juice left in that anymore for them. And uh, the taxes that most people pay are 
invisible to them. You know, if you're a renter, you pay your landlord's taxes and that sort of things. So if tax cuts are not going to be the leading part of the rights economic agenda, what do you got? Jim? What should um, they be talking about? Uh, uh, the, the, what's wrong with you? Why do you no longer believe in the wonder working power of tax cuts? <laughs> I, think, I think there's Thank you. some issues here. Heretic. Uh, <laughs> Um, but but uh, I, I think you're basically right. Uh, there was a, a poll that came out last summer, um, and it asked people, you know, what, what's, what's more important, uh, having an econ policies that create a, an economy of growth or policies that redistribute wealth? And thank goodness, the, the, the majority, 65, 70% of people said we have to grow this economy, that it's far more important than wealth redistribution. Then they, then they gave them a bunch of policies. Now, which of these policies do you think are more likely to boost the economy? And coming in at number one was raising the minimum wage, <laughs> by far. Somewhere way down low, with the, which a minority of people thought would be good, were high-end tax cuts and tax cuts for business. Um, and you know, there were, a Pew poll came out recently, and they asked people, uh, are taxes you pay about right, too much? People said about right. Are you worried about tax complex complexity? Eh, not too much. We use TurboTax. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we, you know, what's the big problem with the tax code? Rich people don't pay enough. So, that, so that's sort of where we are. So I think certainly the political oomph of coming in and saying uh, we have some tax cuts for you, and especially at the same time that we have a you know, $17 trillion deficit that people aren't going to believe these tax cuts are going to pay for themselves. And to come in and say, you know what I got for you? I got a 15% flat tax. Sure, oh, crazy people at CBO said it's going to lose a trillion dollars a year. Don't believe them. This thing's going to be great. We're going to get 5% growth. And that's pretty much all we have to talk about. And, you know, yeah, sure, I have an education policy and, you know, you know K-12, I'll have some higher education and maybe some entitlement reform. but. Oh, no, no entitlement right, reform. Right, right. No, that, right. Now, now we're not going to, now that just means Medicaid. It doesn't mean Medicare, Social Security, it just means Medicaid. And, and entitlement that, reform that, for that, poor people, that, not that, for old people. That's, those are earned benefits, my friends. Uh, so yeah, so I think you need, a, you need a much wider portfolio. If, I think if voters walk in to the voting booth in 2016, and, they're, and what they, when they think about Republicans, they're like, this is the party whose big idea is high-end tax cuts. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they're going to do very well. So, so what you're saying is that it's politically expedient to become a snake oil salesman. <laughs> so you're Trump 2016. I'm Trump 2016. Yeah, okay, well, I was, I was Trump 2012. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was Trump 1812. <laughs> so yeah, I think that I, I agree with that. I think that I, it, you know this gets back to the point that I made it as a, a, a free market movement, as a freedom movement. We need to be better about talking about you know, why markets are important and what the policies are that help drive growth. So when you think that every tax cut is created equally when it comes to the economy, right away you've got to disconnect with how, with how tax, tax policy actually works and with what people think about. So um, I think that we need to be, as a movement, better able to articulate what tax policy means to ordinary Americans. So if you want to get the economy growing, it's not that you're for giving tax cuts to the rich per se, but you're about growing jobs and opportunity. And through tax cuts for through the rich. Through tax cuts for the rich. <laughs> right. you know, uh, so you're telling me I'm stuck too. <laughs> but I think there's, you know, I think that there's a lot, you talk about the minimum wage. It's one of those things that sounds good reflexively, who wouldn't be for everybody making more, but we're not good necessarily at articulating why the minimum wage is harmful because it makes, you know, employers, you know, suck up the cost and pass it on to consumers, all that. Well, the real reason is that it harms opportunity for the people who are least advantaged in society. And when we start having those kinds of conversations, then I think we can move the dial a little bit. But we're not very good about talking other than, you know, the economics of it in a way that doesn't resonate with, with ordinary people who are just trying to put bread on the table. You know, I, I want to speak to one of the, uh, the questions that, that came up here, which someone wants to know what we think about crony capitalism. And uh, so I was home in, in Lubbock, Texas, uh, a couple years ago, and I'm out on you know, Farm Road 1162, which is just barely paved. It's out in the middle of the cotton fields. And some 22-year-old kid is coming blazing up this farm road out of a cotton farm in his new Maserati Quattroporte. 
because his family farm is divided <coughs> up into eight separate individual right. small farms. Get their and farm they collect a million dollars a year in cotton subsidies. Um, if you walk around Manhattan, where National Review's offices are, there's something like 97 addresses in Manhattan receiving agricultural subsidies. Yeah. For which, long. now the Bronx I get, because they're growing weed up there. <laughs> but uh, I don't think that's actually subsidized, Is that subsidized? yet. Um, you know, on my, on my bad days, on my, you know, I'm filing my income taxes and thinking about the people who actually are profiting from this sort of crony capitalism, you know, I don't want to protest. I want to commit acts of terrorism against ethanol facilities is what I want to do. Um, why isn't the right getting its uh, Elizabeth Warren Occupy Wall Street class warfare groove on about this issue of, uh, of what's just outright theft? Uh, you know, crony capitalism is a huge, huge problem in this town. Um, it's why we have a gazillion dollar a year lobbying industry here. And it's, it's simple hijacking. What can't, why aren't they doing more? What well, it's can't not they do? just this town, though. It's every state capital well, right, sure, across yeah. the country I mean, and I'm local for governments, Austin too. too. And local governments. <laughs> du duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> and, but local governments hire huge lobbyists to come to Washington yeah. to, get, you know, <laughs> to get their federal subsidies, too. So I think it's a huge problem. I think it's beginning to get some attention. And this is exactly. You know, one of the reasons that free markets are important because free markets, if they're truly free, serve as better checks on that. So think about how, you know, when we were back in, uh, in the Great Recession, what was the, you know, what was the free market answer? We're going to have a stimulus package and we're going to have a bunch of green jobs. An abject, utter failure, failure, most notoriously, you know, painted by the picture of the failed Solyndra company. But we have lots of crony capitals, and we have it on the tax side, and we have it on the spending side, and we have it on the regulatory side as well. And I think this is a great argument to talk about how government intervention interferes with free markets to the detriment of everybody. So I was reading today, for example, about, and I wanted to talk about entrepreneurship, but how regulators, there's no more voracious appetite than the appetite of a politician and a, and a regulator. So the FDA now is trying to regulate, thanks to Dianne Feinstein, um, artisanal soaps that you can get at Whole Foods and other places like that. And um, who do you think is behind that? Johnson & Johnson, Unilever, um, and Revlon, and a bunch of other companies like that. So, and of course, it's the... the soap mafia. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the soap mafia. But it's also the Artisanal Soap Trade Association who is protesting this. And I read it on Facebook, so it must be true. <laughs> but, um, so we have cronyism in all parts of the government. We've got it in the regulatory arena, we have it in the tax side, we've got it on the spending side, and it's abjectly corrupt and needs to be rooted out, and free marketers need to be better at, at calling it out. Yeah, so for instance, I think, you know, <coughs> I like Boeing, they seem like nice people, but they do have their own marketing department. What? They probably don't need the Export-Import Bank to be doing that for them, but we've been trying to kill this damn thing for ever. No sign of it actually getting killed. What's the, uh, what's that? Have we been trying to kill it forever? For a while. Or we've been paying lip service. I mean, maybe not as long as the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm glad we got rid of it. Oh, wait, we didn't, did we? But, um, Jim, what are the prospects for, um, for dealing with this? Well, no, I mean, I think focusing on, it creates sort of, you know, what are, what are sort of the lens in which you're going to look at, you know, sort of center-right policies? And I think the lens is that, is that on sort of on the business economic side, we want to have as competitive an economy as possible where businesses succeed or fail based on the value they are providing, not on their ability to lobby Washington. Um, uh, I once asked the head of the, uh, uh, you know, this is like a classic consulting moment, but the head, <clears throat> the head of the McKinsey Global Institute, um, who later went to, I think went to work for President Obama, but they, I asked her, well, what is, how, how do you get an economy to grow? What, what's, what's, what's the key? And she sort of you know, leaned forward and said, maximum competitive intensity. Now those, now that's, that's like, that's, that's great like consultant talk. And that's sort of, <laughs> so like, that's like, well, yeah, that's great. We need to have that's more. That's not that. one that. meaningless word. That's uh, three that's meaningless three. words. <laughs> but I think that's actually 
kind of right. We do want these. We want companies to be competing, and as much competition and as creative destruction, mm -hmm. while also telling people we're actually gonna, we're, we are going to have a, a safety net. We're going to have a safety net that encourages work, that's fiscally sustainable. Uh, that we're not for getting rid of that. We're friends. We're for reforming and transforming that, and having those two pieces. And I think the crony capitalism bit, to the effect that we're that that we're uh, against policies that help incumbents, uh, you know, you know, maintain their market position with through taxes or regulation, I think that is key to making the broader free market argument. Now, you know, the Ashburn Power Bank, um, I think if you ask most people, if you said, listen, you know, we know we had this big financial crisis, maybe you heard of it, and uh, so we're finally, going, we're, we're finally going after the banks. They're like, yes, finally going after the banks. We're, good. we're going after J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, no, the Export Import Bank. Oh, what? Nope. what? <laughs> I, I, I remember we had, uh, I remember, I think maybe it, was, maybe it was two years ago, we had uh, the, Jamie Dimon, um, I have nothing against J.P. Morgan at all, uh, but Jamie Dimon, who was a you know, Democrat, and you know, you know, they, 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 got their, they got their bit from um, TARP, that he came in to uh, a, 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 a hearing in the Senate, and, and this was right after I think there was, like, there was a trading problem, there was like a two, it was like the London Whale, and there was like a $2 billion error, and the Republicans, and the Senate said they didn't want to talk about that. They're like, who are we to judge, judge this fine company that made $19 million, billion last year? They, they practically gave Jamie Dimon a, you know, a standing ovation as a conquering hero. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to take Republicans seriously in crony capitalism uh, when they want to do something about the financial system other than saying uh, repealing Dodd-Frank and letting them all go bust. When they, when they are saying, hey, we need to maybe drastically increase capital levels so there's no way these things could go bust, to get rid of too big to fail, something like that, I'll take them seriously on crony capitalism. But when it's, when, it, when, they're, when they're, I suppose you gotta start somewhere with the Export-Import Bank. I just think it strikes me as kind of an, an odd thing when you still have a financial system which is too big to fail to begin really focusing on the Export-Import Bank. And do you think capital reform is really the easiest way to go about I, I think I think that's. I mean, I suppose you could, you could try to break them up, or but I think the lo the logical way is just have them hold a whole lot more capital that's not that you can't game it. So it doesn't matter if the regulators are going back and forth, uh, you know, from uh, Senate staffer you know, or to the White House. <laughs> you know, the let's make that make that irrelevant. White House chief of staff. Have White House right. chief of staff. Three times in a row. <laughs> uh, so. I, I, so I remember uh, I used to work for Reuters, and I remember I went over to interview uh, Larry Summers, who was at the time Obama's chief economic advisor. And I, so I walked in sort of the you know the outer office, and of course Larry Summers worked at a hedge fund. And, and uh, I think every guy in that office, like, had come from either Citigroup or Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan. So, and I'm pretty sure that's they were going uh, back there. Now, I love banks. I have no problem with Wall Street, and I love the capital allocation process. And I love getting Goldman Sachs research in my uh, email box every morning. Uh, but I think that's, I might want to focus on that first. Well, I think that's great. I do think that the import export bank, I'm a little bit encouraged about it, but it is so small, but it's, I think it would be a great victory to have and we'd have some incremental progress on it. Mm -hmm. But you touched on one of the things that I think is really important in how we think about a free market and a free society, and that's to have the freedom to fail. Whether that's a big bank, whether it's you know other kinds of markets, or whether it's individuals being allowed to experiment, whether it's an entrepreneur to be allowed to fail, and we somehow in this country, in all walks of life, in every element of our culture, have gotten away from we learn and we're stronger when we fail and we reemerge and we keep trying, and I think that's important in our schools. I think that's important in our private lives, and I think that's important in every element. Uh, of, our, of our government policy. That's why we have a huge entitlement welfare state. Um, and I think by getting away from that, um, we're gonna you know, really free people up a lot more to have better lives. Yeah, one of the great things about the sort of American economic regime is that the, uh, the price of business failure, personally, is, is quite low. Uh, you know, I mean, the worst thing that's gonna happen to you financially is you have to declare bankruptcy. It's hard to borrow money for the next seven years mm -hmm. or so. But, um, you can always tell where the priorities are for the government because you can discharge anything in bankruptcy except taxes and student loans. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, which That's are, right. you know, both the man is going to get his, his cut of those things. Now, I threatened uh, Jim with asking questions about negative interest rates on Swiss franc deposits. Uh, so, but maybe an, uh, an, an indirectly related question, which is that someone wants to know if you think that the uh, Fed 
it's going to raise interest rates uh, by the 2016 election uh, with the understanding that you're not actually offering financial advice on interest rate swaps. <laughs> uh, where is the Fed going with this? Uh, now, we had, we had a GDP number the other day that came out of like, it was like 11 cents GDP growth in the last uh, quarter, something like that. It was like, it was like couch cushion change. Uh, so the Fed is probably not going to rush out to jack up rates just immediately, but where are we going with interest rates? Well, I, I, think, I think the Fed will probably raise interest rates and it will be a very slow climb. I don't think they're, I think, uh, I, think given in the, I think given sort of the global economy, I think given uh, that they perceive that there's still slack in the uh, labor market, We'll, we'll see what wages do. They're, they say they're data dependent, so we'll see if the data is any better. I've been hearing about the year, this is supposed to be our big year of acceleration, you know, since 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. This is like recovery summer uh, seven, It right? is, uh, it is we are, we are, a very slow recovery. Fast and furious seven, recovery uh, covers uh, summer uh, seven. The year, I mean, year after year, um, in, from 2009, 2010, 2011, every year, you know, the Obama administration will put out, you know, their economic report, the president, and every one of those uh, reports, it said we are, that there was a mini boom just around the corner of like 4% year after year, 4% GDP growth. And somehow, somehow we missed it this year, but don't worry, it's, it's coming. It's next year, uh, for sure. It does not seem to be coming very quickly. And even, uh, I mentioned uh, Goldman Sachs earlier, a lot of Wall Street firms, again, thought this was gonna be the year of acceleration. Well, we saw no growth in the first quarter. We'll see if we see a snap back in the second. Um, but right now we've sort of lowered our expectation for what a like a boom is to three percent, which is basically what the economy has grown since the, in, in the post-war era. Uh, so that's so we we sort of lowered our expectations, and um, you know so yeah, I think the Fed uh, will act. I think you know I, I've I've been a lot more positive about Fed actions than maybe some people in this room over the past few years. Uh, but we need to begin thinking about how we're going to grow this economy faster and increase the growth potential of this economy. Tax cuts. Tax cuts. <laughs> <laughs> to quote President George W. Bush, it's important to cut the taxes. <laughs> it is important to cut the taxes. Well, do you have any, uh, Allison, any real outside the box uh, proposals to increase growth? Uh, other than uh, we always hear about tax cuts, deregulation, uh, simplify the tax code, put Ben Bernanke in stocks, <laughs> in the public square. I guess it's Janet Yellen now. No, I think. You know, I think that... Um, for all those things. Yeah, and for all those things, right. But I, the I baseline. Th yeah. <laughs> I mean, beyond the baseline. Yeah, policy. I mean, I, I think that there, you know, is there a brass ring for us to pull for? Well, not, not necessarily. That's why I like, would like to talk a little bit about technology or keep talking about technology. It's the new stuff that's going to come along and be really innovative um, as long as we don't regulate it. So, so I guess one of my, my, my points is we, we've kind of talked about a lot of the things that are important. We do have to have good tax policy. We shouldn't be mindlessly talking about, you know, let's have another tax cut, let's have another tax cut. Um, I think we ought to um, completely reject raising taxes, um, and that seems to we forget that uh, Washington has raised taxes relentlessly over the last six, seven years. Um, I think that's very pro problematic. Um, and uh, I think we all agree that the regulatory uh, state has grown tremendously over the last, last uh, six years. That's immensely problematic, um, and it's continuing to grow immensely problematic. So I guess my first, you know, radical outside the box thinking would be, uh, let's do no more harm. So let's do things like protecting the internet. Let's not raise taxes anymore. Um, we can think about what a good tax policy ought to be, whether it's the flat tax or other kinds of things, but we have to do it in a realistic way and fully embrace understanding what that will do to, for the economy and what that will do to our debt levels. Um, and we need to really think about rolling back spending. I mean, it, and it sounds trite, but it's really important. The bigger government gets, the wrong incentives are, are at place in the marketplace and for people as individuals. And um, so a couple of the must-dos are, are to tackle entitlements and to get rid of farm subsidies, which are small when it comes to the budget, which is why we, I keep coming back to we have got to tackle the entitlement, uh, the entitlement programs 
not to abolish them, but to modernize them, to make them work better, to have things that market work better with markets, like choice, ownership, control, market competition in healthcare, market competition in retirement savings, and things like that, but to have it smaller and to get away from this mentality that it's terrible to fail. Space elevators. Space elevators. Fine, awesome. You have your entitlement. Space elevators. They easily transport on a, on a, on a six mile high nanotech carbon thread. Uh, you, know, you know, cargo all the way to our space station. Uh, yeah. I think I like big ideas. Um, so that that might that might be one. I actually would like to see more uh, more public investment uh, in, in science. But the one sort of statistic I've written a lot about is the past 30 years. We've seen the number of starts in this country cut in half. We talk a lot about Silicon Valley. I would think a lot more about how we can create a lot more good science in this country and how that science can be translated uh, by entrepreneurs into new goods and services. And that, that, that might be tax policy, it might be regulation, uh, certainly it's education. Um, but that's, that's I, I, if you want innovation, that's how you're going to get it. Maybe a federal invasion of California. <laughs> you know, our, our, General, our friends on that. the left uh, like to point to international comparisons a lot, you know. And isn't Denmark a really nice place? Denmark really is a nice place. And isn't Norway a nice place? And uh, Netherlands and various places. And they like these European welfare states. But we never really put where we are in the right international context. If you look at federal, state, and local spending in the United States, our public sector is about the size of Canada's. Uh, our corporate income tax is twice what Sweden's is. Uh, our capital <laughs> gains tax is infinitely more than Switzerland's, which doesn't have one. Uh, Switzerland just had a referendum on a national minimum wage, and they said, well, no thanks. Uh, don't need one. Well, we've got it figured out. So um, I don't know if it's just a rhetorical thing, but I think it's more than a rhetorical thing of saying, well, yeah, we, we wouldn't mind having Sweden's corporate income tax rate. Uh, that's not such a bad thing at 20% instead of ours uh, at, the, at the highest in the world. You know, w there's a myth, I think, of where the United States actually is in comparison with other countries that we're some sort of small government free market outlier. And if you really drill down into the numbers, I don't think that uh, that holds up. So I guess the, and we'll probably be closing out on this or something close to this. Um, in terms of international comparisons, are there other countries you look at um, where there's a policy environment or specific policies where you say, we really ought to think about doing things that way? And if you say, I'm, I'm, I'm Thomas Friedman, I want to be China for the day, I am going to throw you out. Well, uh, to, quote, uh, to quote Rocket Raccoon from Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> I was hoping someone would. <laughs> there ain't no one like us but us. It's very difficult to compare the U.S. We're so like our own thing. Yeah. And, sort of the, and really the, the, the deep magic of America really is in the fact we have this super small government uh, compared to these other countries or corporate taxes. It, it is really what I said earlier. It's our ability to create lots of not just Know, new companies, but fast-growing companies. If you look at the number, if you look at uh, wh which country has the most sort of billionaire entrepreneur, which is a which is someone who got rich by providing a really a value-added product. It's not even cl no other large economy is anywhere close to the number per you know adjusted for the size of our country as the United States does. I mean, so that that is what we need to focus on and do more of. Uh, I think you're right that a lot of people they don't understand the Scandinavian examples very well. They understand that you know the very very open labor markets, uh, they tax capital a lot differently. So I, yeah, I think we should draw, uh, we should use those examples so people just don't point to the, you know, the paradise that is Scandinavia and their, and their, and their, gi and their giant government, which is sort of where the Democrats want to take us. But we have to remember sort of what we do really, uh, really, really well and make sure we keep doing that. I think that was excellently said. Um, I think there's lots of things here and there that we can learn from other countries. So if you look at Scandinavia, they also have more choice in social, their social security programs. Same thing on lots of parts of Europe. Look at Switzerland. Look at some of the things that Ireland has done right. Um, we can tax way differently and way more efficiently. You look at Hong Kong. There's great things about the free markets in Hong Kong. But uniquely, you know, we are... Are there still great things about the markets in Hong Kong? <laughs> or the Chinese sort of ruin them? Well, yeah. Sell a lot of umbrellas now. It looks like a lot of umbrellas. They're certainly one of the most economically free countries in the world, and, and are they going the right way? What are the Chinese going to do? I'm, I, that's not my expertise to say. Um, but I, I think that we are uniquely American, and there's things that we can learn from on the margins, um, but we need to capitalize on, on really what our uh, unique opportunities are as entrepreneurs. 
um, in an entrepreneurial kind of country and to ensure that we, um, that we keep that intact. And, yeah. and Jim, you mentioned uh, entrepreneurship, and that's one of the interesting things about where we are in the global context right now, which is that with the uh, advent of globalization and the, and the connectivity we have and the openness generally of markets around the world, it's a really, really good time to be a successful entrepreneur, to be someone with some specific set of skills, to be someone with some managerial talent. Um, it's the same dynamic where that, um, you know, if you were the most successful car salesman in a city of 100,000, you made a certain amount of money. If you were the most successful car salesman in a city of a million, you made a lot more money. We're all now effectively operating in global markets. So if you're someone who is, uh, you know, at the top 10% of the top 5% of your particular field, or business right now. I mean, there's never been a better time in economic history. Things are just uh, enormously, enormously uh, fruitful. But if you're at the sort of 50% mark and below in terms of your success, your skills, your education, mm -hmm. it's a really hard time. Uh, you know, the people who complain about globalization as though it were something that could be reversed do have a point to the extent that American workers are now competing with directly, especially low-skilled American workers, uh, people overseas, uh, much more than they ever did in the past. So um, they are giving me the wrap-up signal there. I think they're going to bring people out. <laughs> in short, though. After uh, that question? After that question, <laughs> yeah. Are there, yes. things, are there things, we could or, <laughs> things we could or should be doing to, uh, to help out those workers who are not positioned well to benefit from, from what's going on? Uh, one, recognize that reality, recognize that a rising tide isn't lifting all boats, and if we have 4% GDP growth, that still may not be good enough for the rising tide to lift uh, all those boats. And when you're talking about you know, policies, you're saying, I don't like the minimum wage, it hurts jobs, it hurts upper mobility, fine, but the answer can't be get rid of the minimum wage and get rid of the EITC and call it a day. Fair enough. And one of the places that really cares about whether rising tides uh, lifts boats is Louisiana. And uh, Governor Jindal is here. So we will wrap things up. Alice and Jim, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, please welcome Bobby Jindal.